Morning, everyone. Uh, we're going to start this morning. It is now 9.03. Um, first thing we should do is uh, do a roll call. So, um, uh, Governor Bell. Here. Uh, Governor Ottawale. Here. Governor Angeville. Here. Governor Boyd. Here. Governor Clark. Here. Governor Couch. Here. Governor Dresden. Here. Governor Higginson. Governor McBride. Here. Governor Peterson. Yes. Governor Pertzer. Here. Governor Sayani. Here. Uh, Governor Stevens. Uh, Governor Williams Ruth. Here. Um, before we get going, the chair recognizes Governor Williams Ruth. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, sorry, Mr. President. Um, just taking a moment today to recognize the fact that once again, our calendar for BOG meetings happens to fall on the uh, Hindu New Year celebration of Diwali. And today is the third day. Um, for those who don't know, Diwali is a festival of lights and is celebrated by Hindus, Sikhs, and some Buddhists uh, that generally lasts five days. And it's all about the hope of the, the new and the light and bringing in the joy and celebration and letting go of the past. And so I just want to recognize again, as I did last year, that we are fortunate uh, to have a very multicultural state bar association. And for everyone who celebrates, we recognize you and say thank you. And as I was looking at other significant events for today, I realized that in the city of Ruston, where we are right now, just down the street about two miles, is what's called the Chinese Reconciliation Memorial. And it was 136 years ago yesterday that Tacoma woke up to the horrible reality that the mayor and the assistant fire chief had, and a gang of 200 people rounded up and forced out all of the Chinese immigrants in, in Tacoma. And that that is one of the reasons why Tacoma doesn't have the thriving international district that cities like Seattle and San Francisco do. So if you don't know about that history, check out that project and realize that again, where we have come as a society where we are here recognizing other faiths and cultures and their celebrations is rooted in the fact that we don't have the greatest history ourselves, but that there is opportunities for growth and reconciliation. So again, to be here on this day and celebrate these things is truly a monumental occasion. And I thank the chair for the time and I look forward to an amazing day today. Thank you, Governor Williams Ruth. Uh, this morning, we're gonna do our annual anti-harassment training. And uh, we have a representative here from um, law firm of Fisher, Phillips, Nate Bailey, who's gonna do that. But before he gets going, our executive director wanted to talk about um, some CLE credits. So good morning, everyone. Uh, just a reminder that this, uh, the live presentation this morning is accredited for one CLE credit. Uh, in order to receive your credit, you will need to email Kevin Platchy uh, to let him know that you attended the training. You'll need to provide your name and your bar number. Uh, Kevin will drop his email address in the chat if you don't already have it. Uh, and for those of you who are watching this on YouTube, this is only available for folks who are watching the program live. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, good morning, Mr. Bailey, you're, you're up. Thank you. Uh, First of all, thanks for having me and um, it's great to be here. This is, I can't even believe how beautiful this setting is. I didn't even know that silver clouds were this nice to be honest, so um, this is pretty cool. Um, let me share my screen here. All right. All right, so um, what I wanted to talk today about was 
preventing harassment. Um, and just so you know a little bit about my background, I'm a management side employment attorney. Um, I feel like maybe there's a misperception that management side employment attorneys are all about um, you know, protecting harassers in this context or protecting discriminators or you know, helping to get companies off after they've done something bad. Um, and that's not, you know, how we at Fisher Phillips view our, view our roles. We, we try to help people kind of avoid those things in the first place. Um, one of the, one of the really great things, um, about the WSBA and I've, I've gotten to work a little bit with the WSBA over the years, uh, is, is they have uh, a strong leadership that is really committed to, um, you know, the values of the membership, which is, uh, you know, very diverse, but but overall is about protecting justice and, and equity for, for all. And um, so this is a big part of that. And so I think, you know, an anti-harassment program like the WSBA has is a really important part of any DEI um, overall program. So I'm really happy to be here talking about this today. And um, I'm going to assure you that I'm a true believer in, um, in the cause here. Um, just as a real quick agenda today, what we're going to do is go over a couple of reasons why uh, anti-harassment training is important. Um, there's going to be really one reason that I focus on, but um, then there are a couple of other reasons that I think are also worth mentioning. Um, and then I want to get us all on the same page about sort of the legal terms we're going to use, um, and that's protected class, discrimination, harassment, retaliation. Uh, probably all of us are, are attorneys here, and we all have a pretty good idea of what those mean. Um, but the legal terms are a little bit different than even, you know, the policy terms here at the WSBA and at probably your law firms. Um, and so, so I think it's worth making that distinction and exploring how, you know, throughout the presentation, how that, um, kind of manifests itself. This, this plan or this, uh, program is sort of focused on the governors. Um, it sounds like we have members here as well, non-governors. Uh, this really is applicable to, I think, everyone. Um, you could, if you wanted, just, just substitute managers and supervisors for governors here. But even if you're not a manager or supervisor, again, as attorneys, we're all sort of leaders in our organizations. So, um, so I think it's applicable to all of us. Uh, there will be no pop quiz. Um, so <laughs> don't worry about that. I do want to ask that anybody who wants to ask questions or participate, feel free to do so. Um, uh, I think a dialogue on this would be a little more fun and, uh, and, and just better for everyone. All right, so the number one reason to um, care about anti-harassment training, anti-harassment policies, is just that sexual harassment, harassment in general, harms victims. Um, this, these are sort of platitudes here shouldn't be tolerated by any entity. Um, and I just put a little clip of WSBA's mission, which includes serving the public, ensuring integrity and championing justice. And so I think uh, it, it's probably pretty clear that if there is sexual harassment going on or any type of harassment or discrimination, um, that, that the WSBA is not living up to its mission. And so all of us here can play a vital role in helping the WSBA live up to that mission. There are a couple of others. Um, and I, I really wanna emphasize, I think these are kind of subordinate reasons to care about anti-harassment. Um, but lawsuits are costly. It's embarrassing for everyone and it's stressful. Um, and I, I say that it's, it's that way for plaintiffs as well. And as a management side employer, we, I do come across um, plaintiffs that I think are maybe more on the opportunistic side, but I feel like that's pretty rare. Um, so often when, when we get harassment cases that I don't think meet the legal standard for harassment, that plaintiff really feels they've been wronged. Um, and so that manifests itself in a number of ways before even becoming a lawsuit, um, which we'll talk about a little later. Um, the lawsuits hurt the reputation of the organization. I think that's even more important for a, an organization like the WSBA that that serves such a prominent um, and public-facing role. Um, 
professionalism leads to just higher productivity um, and lower turnover. So there's some really key business reasons to uh, stamp out harassment and maintain a, a culture at any firm or um, organization that, that does not tolerate discrimination or harassment. And this is what I was alluding to earlier when mentioning that even before we get to the lawsuit stage, um, those plaintiffs who feel they've been wronged, but even don't meet the standard for legal harassment, uh, they've already lost productivity. They've already taken a lot of resources um, or used a lot of resources from the company. And if we could just shift that to helping them overcome that um, and helping coworkers work better together, <clears throat> excuse me, um, companies and organizations could take back a lot of that productivity. Uh, I don't wanna overstate this, but individuals in Washington can be named in lawsuits. So, um, so it's a good idea to um, protect yourself as well. Um, my point here, you can take appropriate steps before and after. It really requires both. You can't just set up a good policy um, and then do good investigations. You have to take um, steps after complaints too to, um, to ameliorate the harassment or the harassing behavior that has already gone on. Um, and we'll talk about that through some hypotheticals uh, a little bit later. So the legal definitions, um, I guess I, I live in this world every day, so I tend to think these are pretty straightforward, um, but feel free to ask questions if you have any about these. Um, protected classes are just groups that are protected by law from discrimination and harassment. That doesn't mean every, every type of person or every characteristic that you um, identify as is protected by law. Um, but by and large, a lot of anti-harassment policies go above and beyond the protected classes that are protected by law. So um, um, it's a good distinction to know as a leader of an organization when something might be unlawful, but then also to, to recognize when there might be harassing type behavior that isn't um, necessarily implicating the law. Um, these are also characteristics that may not be considered when making employment decisions. Um, and that includes any type of, of employment decision. Um, in the harassment context, if offensive behavior is targeted at an employee because of a protected class, it may become harassment. And there's actually been, over the last several years, a trend toward bystander harassment as well. So if, if offensive behavior is, is occurring in the workplace, um, even those employees who it's not targeted at can be victims of, of unlawful harassment um, per some, some more recent court holdings. Generally in that case, the, the harassing behavior has to be pretty, um, um, pretty egregious, um, but the trend more is, is toward protecting employers, employees, excuse me, more and more. And so, especially here in Washington and the Ninth Circuit, that's something to keep in mind. So the protected classes are just, there's a lot of them. Um, federal law includes, includes a lot. State and local law adds several others. Um, gender identity, transgender folks um, are protected in our state and local law. I think they, I think they are, are by and large protected under, under federal law, especially here in the Ninth Circuit. Um, but it's not always clear that that's the case. Um, the EEOC certainly takes the, the position that they are. Um, marital status, family relationships, um, injuries, workplace injuries, and, and medical conditions, which includes non-workplace injuries. Um, all of these are, are categories or characteristics that if someone is subjected to harassment or offensive behavior, um, that would be potentially unlawful harassment. Uh, just really quickly, this isn't a presentation that's focused on discrimination, but um, making any employment decision because of an employee or applicant's protected class is discrimination. 
Um, and that can be hiring, firing, compensation, um, all of these, all of these different categories. Evaluations is a big one. Um, a lot of times employees are unhappy with their evaluations um, and, and believe that it might be due to some discriminatory intent. Um, I have other terms and conditions highlighted here because that's where harassment falls. Um, sure. So I'm curious, so it says discrimination for hiring. So if I go and hire and I want to hire someone because they are gay, does that mean the person who is not then has a discrimination case against me, even though they may have been a better candidate, but I wanted to hire the gay person? That's a great question, yes. And I, you know, that is a, a tough area of law right now. Um, there are been a lot of groups that have been in, in the protected classes that have been historically disadvantaged. And it, it's really difficult to find a way now under existing federal and state law to, to try to help those groups of people um, in a way that doesn't then violate these, these laws that ostensibly are, are here to protect those very people. Um, and so that's a really difficult thing to do. Um, and, and I would encourage anyone who wants to adopt any kind of affirmative action type plan to work with an attorney and, and figure out how best they can do that. So other terms and conditions of employment, um, that's where harassment comes in. Harassment is uh, a subset of discrimination. Um, harassment is defined as offensive, intimidating or hostile behavior relating to any protected characteristic. And again, uh, under your policy, that can go beyond what the law protects. Um, it has to be uh, so severe or pervasive that it unreasonably interferes with work performance. And it has to be objectively offensive and also, also subjectively offensive to the victim. Um, so we apply a reasonable person standard as a threshold. And then we also make sure that this person was actually offended. Um, now here's a little snippet from the um, WSBA Board of Governors and a harassment policy and procedure. Uh, engaging in any act that discriminates against an employee because of sex will not be tolerated. That dot, dot, dot includes all of the other uh, protected classes as well. Um, retaliation uh, is prohibited by the policy. Um, no one will suffer retaliation. Um, and then I think a big uh, area that, that a lot of employers aren't thinking about or don't have a plan of action to uh, take into account is how this policy is going to apply during non-working hours. Um, harassment is, is a little bit of a different animal than other discrimination. You don't hire someone when it's not working hours. Um, and, and so that really only occurs at work. Harassment, because it's offensive behavior, because employees are friends with each other, because employees might live in the same neighborhoods, uh, harassment can occur away from the workplace and it can be brought back then into the workplace and make that workplace hostile, even if the conduct occurred somewhere else. Uh, harassment, there are a couple of different kinds of harassment. Um, quid pro quo harassment is is probably what we all think of as the most egregious. It's just when someone in power um, demands essentially sexual favors in exchange for a job benefit. Um, the same is true if, if there is a, a threat of a job detriment. Um, the, the threat or the offer can be implicit. It doesn't need to be in an email. Um, and this is an area where in litigation, there can often be uh, a, a, a dispute of fact where one party insists that there was this offer or this threat and the other party says, hey, I was, I was just you know, um, acting as a manager but also asking this person out. There's a, there's a lot of um, room for, for misunderstandings 
Um, and, and that's one of the reasons why everybody has to be so vigilant about, um, about anti-harassment. Physical behavior, of course, of course can be harassment. Um, all, of, all of this type of behavior is behavior that I think we all agree is not professional. Um, and even if it doesn't rise to the level of severe or pervasive type of touching, for example, that would be unlawful, um, it would certainly violate the WSBA's uh, policy against harassment. This is one area where coworkers um, and other managers and supervisors can, can really help their own organizations and the WSBA, because this is an area where if you see these things happening, you can just talk to your HR representative about it. Um, and that doesn't have to be in the form of tattling it doesn't have to be, um, um, it doesn't have to be, looks like we have a question on or threatened. Um, is, that, is that question or threatened touching? Oh, is it? Okay. Got it. Okay. Does the policy apply if during off hours an employee receives calls or emails that make them feel harassed? or threatened, um, potentially. And I would say, I think the spirit of the question, yes. We'd have to know what those, those calls or emails, who they were from, um, what they made them feel harassed or threatened about. Um, for example, calls or emails that, that make someone feel insecure in their job because uh, they are potentially talking about work performance, performance deficiencies in a less than sensitive way. That does not, that, that's not the kind of harassment we're talking about. That is something maybe that, that managers and, and directors can, can help uh, coach those supervisors on better performance management. Um, but that often does lead employees to feel harassed and threatened. Um, now, if the harassment of, and threatening type behavior in those emails and calls is related to any kind of protected characteristic, that would be harassment or, um, or uh, discrimination potentially under the policy. Um, it, again, it would have to rise to the level of severity or pervasiveness um, that, it, that it alters the terms and conditions of employment before that's gonna be an unlawful harassment. Feel free to ask a follow-up question if I, if I didn't address that well. Um, verbal behavior can be um, harassment. Um, this is again, um, a lot of this is, is very uh, intuitive. I think where the gray area comes in is when uh, people are joking and, and talking among themselves and people can overhear that. Um, that can be offensive to the person who's overhearing. Um, and we'll talk about that a little later, hopefully with some uh, engagement, visual behavior. Um, I am actually a little surprised how often we still see this, uh, still see inappropriate pictures in people's office spaces, um, in people's um, locker rooms. We probably don't have a lot of workplaces here that involve locker rooms, um, but anytime there is a locker room, it's a really good idea for management to to walk through every once in a while and make sure that the locker room is not um, maybe the stereotypical locker room that we think of. This is a, this is a really important area right now. Um, this is sort of all, all of these obvious areas of harassment that we've talked about, this one is less obvious. And that's where um, we hold people to certain standards of conduct based on stereotypes. Um, a really common one is, you know, women who are assertive in the in the workplace, or women who um, have are perceived to have strongly held opinions, are often held to a different standard than men who are equally or more assertive and have, you know equal or stronger opinions. Um, and so that's something that, that uh, is 
potentially unintentional by the perpetrator. And, and if um, folks notice that, especially in management, um, those are coaching opportunities um, that should be taken. So we already addressed this a little bit in the question. Um, harassment can really occur anywhere. Uh, obviously it can occur at the workplace and, and employer sponsored events, but it can also occur at non-employee spon employer sponsored events um, and in just personal communications between employees. So the WSBA actually is in a little bit of a different situation here than um, a lot of maybe office employers, um, like law firms, in that there is a lot of public engagement and employers have a duty to protect employees from harassment, even by members of the public who are using the services provided by that business or that organization. So harassment, uh, workplace harassment can also occur between members of the public and uh, WSBA volunteers or governors or employees. Um, you know, as this uh, picture in the lower left here indicates, if, if employees are out on their own, they set it up themselves just among coworkers, there's no managers, um, and they wanted to go to a happy hour or something, harassment can occur there. And that harassment can be the, the um, responsibility of the employer. As a defense attorney, these are, these are the sorts of excuses we see a lot. Um, you know, I didn't know, I was just joking. It wasn't intentional. Um, a lot of these courts reject them out of hand. Um, and a lot of these, to the extent they are somewhat of a defense, um, you know, harassment, one of the elements of harassment is that it's unwelcome. Um, so if, if you thought it was welcome, that can be a factual defense. But, but there's going to be a dispute, and for all the litigators among us, we know that if you have a factual dispute, that is, that, that is uh, you've already almost lost the lawsuit by having a factual dispute. So I want to just drive home the point of the difference between policy and the difference between law. Um, harassment as defined by the WSBA DOG policy and as defined by federal and state law and local law here up in Seattle, especially, um, are not the same things. So inappropriate jokes, one-off comments um, often don't violate the law. The law, you know, as defense attorneys, we always trot out the old cliche that the law is not a civility code. Um, and, it, and it is true to some extent. But under the WSBA policy, uh, all of those sorts of behaviors, one-off inappropriate jokes, uh, one-off comments, uh, even one-off um, sex stereotyping, that does violate the policy. And so, um, so the fact that it doesn't violate the law does not mean it can, um, it can continue. Right, now we have a couple of hypotheticals. The first one is um, you overhear two employees on break calling each other sexually insensitive names. They're friends, they're joking around together. You know, neither of them is upset about it um, and none of them complains to anyone. First question, is this unlawful harassment? Does anyone wanna volunteer? What is, what is the sexually? Well, I, I was just going to make the observation or rather the question if it would be impacted by the presence of other people around them, other than, I guess, just the listener. Exactly. I think that's the, that's the main point. And I might've had this microphone off. I apologize. Um, we do know that the, the nickname is insensitive. 
So it, it's at least um, falling under the, the harassment policy that way. Um, obviously, somebody is overhearing this, you are overhearing this, and potentially other employees are overhearing it as well. Um, and if you're a manager overhearing this or a supervisor, even if nobody else overhears at this time, you don't know if these people are joking around at other times and engaging in the same kind of conduct when you're not there to overhear it. Um, so I would say this is a violation of policy, very likely. Um, and what should you do, if anything? The other, the other kind of reason I included this example is because this is pretty innocuous on the scale of of harassing policy violating behavior. I mean, these are friends and, and, and they're both welcoming the conduct. And so it doesn't necessarily uh, warrant you know, major discipline. This can be just a coaching opportunity, but it is a good idea to get uh, HR involved and let HR make those decisions. Let HR touch base with both employees and make sure that your observation that neither of them are offended is accurate. Um, potentially one of them is feeling a little offended and just doesn't know how to get out of that situation. And I'll note that the WSBA Board of Governors anti-harassment policy does require anybody observing any harassing behavior, even not unlawful behavior, uh, to report that to the HR director. So that would be I think what, if anything, you should do, report this to the HR director um, and let the HR director take it from there. Here's the next one. Anna loves to tell dirty jokes. Um, she tells a joke to a group that includes Sally, who says, that's nothing. Did you hear this worse one? Uh, and that leads Buffy to tell an even more disgusting joke. Sally, who told a you know, dirty joke herself, then complains. Is this harassment? Yes, on everyone's account. Uh, this is certainly harassing behavior, I agree. Um, it's, it's against policy. It's against the policy to, to be telling offensive jokes. Uh, I'm gonna just take it on faith that if it's a dirty joke and an even more disgusting joke that those, that those do violate the policy. Um, what about the fact though that the Sally joined in with the joking and now she's the one who's complaining? So is this something where enthusiastic consent can work through the policy. I mean, if we develop friendships with members of the staff and we're out and do I need to say, I'm about to tell you a really horrible off color, dirty joke. Do you consent to this? I mean, what's the workaround? Because as I'm sitting in here and, and I'm watching these and I've watched it now for two years, I'm wondering what the practical effect is. I mean, it's much like the, you know, dating amongst staff and things. So what's, is, is it, it never, ever, ever can you ever tell a joke without the risk, no matter how long you may have been friends or colleagues or what, what, what's the actual parameters of the reality of these situations? That, that's a really good question. Um, I, I think the answer, unfortunately, is yes, that you can never, ever without the risk. Um, because there is always a risk that somebody's going to be offended and that somehow that relationship sours um, and now people take things differently than they did even in the past. Um, now, does that mean that you can't be friends with people at work and uh, outside of work engage in behavior that maybe is less than professional? I, I don't think that's the case. The um, Not under the federal and uh, state and local law, at least. Uh, the law, like I just already mentioned, and probably any of you who have done uh, employment law have seen in briefs, it's not a civility code. It's not a civility code at work, and it's not a civility code outside of work, uh, certainly. Um, but the problem is when, um, when those jokes and when that behavior 
then comes back to the workplace and makes somebody feel less safe and secure in the workplace. So um, I don't know where that line is, <laughs> you know, um, it, it sounds like it would be defined based on each friendship, you know, and, and your knowledge of, of the other person. Um, but at the same time, like any friendship, um, if, if you're not being in tune to, to what's making your friends uncomfortable, um, then I think there's room for improvement there. Um, but to answer your question, no, this, this doesn't necessarily mean that out of outside of work, um, you have to always be at your most professional. Um, but you need to be thinking about, is this sufficiently away from work to allow this? Am I being sensitive? Um, and those sorts of things. And I know Governor Stevens has a question. Well, I don't have a question, but uh, I wanted to pick up on something uh, that Governor Williams Ruth said. So in his example, he is saying, I'm going to tell you something that is, you know, offensive, wrong, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this is a judgment, but here's the judgment. If you have to, prior to telling the joke, set that up, that should be a cautionary moment where you say, you know what? I shouldn't even go there. I should not go there. Because you've in fact recognized that what you're about to do would in many instances be offensive. And, and that becomes then a judgment and, and ought not be considered a workaround um, for the policy. I think that's well said. Um, and it goes back to the idea that <laughs> that you, you need to be aware of what your friends are, are comfortable with. Um, I do think just from having done this for a number of years, uh, I've seen a lot of strong friendships for a, lots of years result in litigation. Well, I shouldn't say a lot. I've seen a few, um, which seems like too many to me. Um, and I doubt that those went sour based on, you know, one offensive joke outside of the work environment, but it does happen. So next question, would you discipline or counsel anyone? Well, I'm happy to take this one. Um, one of the reasons I included this question is because I want to emphasize that discipline can be is a is a very large spectrum with termination on the one hand and just simple things like coaching and counseling on the other. Um, and this this is certainly a, a situation where in the workplace this violates the policy and um, there needs to be some kind of corrective action taken place. But it doesn't have to be that anybody is humiliated by that corrective action or that people are made to feel like they're bad. Um, it can be really simple coaching, like in the last example. Um, in this example, we have maybe a little more uh, context. We know that Anna loves to tell dirty jokes, so presumably this is not the first time she's done so. Um, so perhaps in her example, that might warrant uh, a little bit more discipline than Sally or Buffy. Um, another consideration here. Yeah, we have a question. So did, would it change your answers in any way if this were a remote working situation and the person who was offended by the joke was someone that the person telling the joke couldn't see and didn't know was present? Yes and no. Uh, uh, in the work environment, telling these types of jokes is contrary to policy. Um, and it's, it's unprofessional behavior. So, I, so we still have that, it still occurred. Um, but certainly in that situation, it was not directed at this person who is, is um, offended by it. 
And perhaps this person at least had the good, you know, the, perhaps Anna in this case, at least had the good judgment to know, hey, if I knew Sally was on the call, I wouldn't have met, mentioned this. Um, but that still does not excuse that this occurred, especially in the workplace. Um, and so, so I think there's still, it needs to be some level of corrective action, whether that's coaching or counseling or, or more. Um, the other thing I wanted to highlight here is that Sally is the one complaining, but Sally already told an escalating, you know, uh, a joke that escalated the situation. So Anna told a dirty joke. Sally said, that's nothing. I got one better. And then Buffy's the one who caps it off with the most disgusting joke. And is Sally entitled to complain in this case? Uh, she was involved in the harassing behavior or the harassing kind of offensive conduct. Anybody have an opinion about that? Yeah. I mean, I, I'd say she's entitled to complain. If I'm looking at how you, how you address the situation, she's also going to be in the you know, discipline and counsel area, but that doesn't take away her right to complain. Absolutely. Um, any employee is entitled to complain when, when they feel uncomfortable about any behavior that's going on in the workplace. And then thankfully we have a good HR director who can then take it from there and, and sort out the issues. Um, so Sally is entitled to complain. Um, would you feel uncomfortable at all disciplining or counseling Sally in this case, given that she's now engaged in some kind of protected activity? I would counsel all of them um, uh, because uh, this really begins to escalate and it's really time. I mean, I, th I think especially to counsel all of them and, and maybe we, we can hear from uh, Glennis on this, but some of this may become you know, go from coaching and counseling to actions if people have, having been counseled continue to, to do that behavior. Because what you have here is now these three, but what you're also having is this notion that it's okay to tell uh, dirty jokes uh, here in the workplace. And I think the real answer is no, it's not okay. And so Anna needs to stand down, as does Sally, as does Buffy. And, and, and if Anna continues to love to do that, Anna may be on her way to more disciplinary uh, actions because she's recalcitrant, even having been coached and having been a part of what set, what set forward uh, finally the Buffy uh, horrible joke. I, I think that's exactly right. Um, Sally engaged in the conduct. She needs to be uh, at least coached or there needs to be some kind of corrective action there as well. Um, again, it doesn't have to be severe, but just because someone complains does not necessarily mean that, that they are excused from the behavior they were engaging in themselves. Um, that leads us to retaliation. So retaliation, it, I'm sure we all understand, is the idea that the law does not allow any person to be um, discriminated against in any way on the basis of their protected activity. Um, and legally, the standard for what is an adverse action under retaliation is a lot broader than what is an adverse action for employment discrimination in the first place. For employment discrimination, there must be some kind of adverse employment action like not hiring the person or demotion. There needs to be a real discrete event that was harmful to that person's employment relationship. Retaliation is anything that would, um, that would discourage someone from engaging in the protected activity. So, even things like, um, um, you know, removing someone from a project that, that they really wanted to be on um, can be taken as retaliation or, or things like shunning in the workplace can be taken as retaliation. If, if people are excluded from meetings because you're worried that they're going to be offended by the jokes you're making um, because they've made a complaint, that can be retaliation. Even though those things wouldn't rise to the level of 
of um, a discriminatory adverse action in a non retaliation context. Um, all of the laws that prohibit discrimination and harassment also prohibit retaliation. Um, federally, that's Title VII, ADEA, ADA. Um, in Washington, our main one is the law against discrimination. But also we have a public policy um, tort in Washington that if someone is terminated for engaging in some kind of uh, public policy related behavior, that can be a, a lawsuit as well. Um, as an employment lawyer, retaliation is one of my biggest fears. It's one of the things that keeps me up at night because so many actions by employees can be protected activity. Um, and so it's likely that any employee who um, you want to discipline or um, needs some kind of performance coaching, they've probably engaged in some kind of protected activity along the way. Uh, and so when you're thinking about any kind of, um, any kind of adverse um, um, discussion with an employee or, or anything of that nature, it's always a good idea to, to get HR involved and help them or allow them to help you through that process and, and spot those issues of where somebody might have engaged in protected activity and help you frame your conversations in a way that does not implicate that protected activity. Um, again, uh, it just has to be enough to discourage the protected activity. And that can be a, a very uh, low bar for plaintiffs to get over. And so um, any kind of retaliatory behavior can really put a company at risk. The other thing that can um, be a problem is just temporal proximity. Uh, anytime someone engages in protected activity and there's any sort of adverse employment action close in time after, and usually that means uh, a couple of months. Courts vary on that. It can be up to, you know, on the, on the longer end within a year. Um, but if, it, if something adverse happens within a couple of months after protected activity, that often is going to be seen as enough temporal proximity to infer retaliatory motive. All right, so uh, we've got a couple of retaliation hypotheticals here. Bob complains that Alf has been using sexually explicit language uh, and stories during team meetings, which Alf leads. HR takes appropriate corrective action uh, with respect to Alf and informs Bob that the issue has been addressed. Alf stops inviting Bob to the team meetings to avoid offending him and because Bob didn't really need to be there anyway. Um, what should you do, if anything? Anybody have any ideas here? Well, I'm happy to take this one. Uh, my, my concern here, one, is if we, we hope that this has been adequately addressed with appropriate corrective action with Bob, and, and we think it has. But if he's not inviting Alf to the meeting, excuse me, if Alf is not inviting Bob to the meetings um, because he doesn't want to offend him, then I guess I really stopped with, these, um, with his explicit language and his stories during these meetings. If he has, he probably shouldn't be too worried that Bob's going to be offended anymore. Um, beyond that, uh, certainly Bob could be discouraged from engaging in further protected activity if he thinks doing so will have him excluded from meetings or excluded from, um, you know, on the job networking opportunities that often come with meetings. So, so this would need to be reviewed as potential retaliation. Um, it certainly feels like it, it could be retaliation, given that we know Bob's motive is, is in part to avoid offending Alf, and that comes right out of the complaint. Um, um, but I think a little twist comes in if we look at this and say, gosh, you know, we don't know why Bob was at those meetings, to be honest. 
Um, and we have an interest as an employer of, you know, having our employees be productive uh, and spend their time efficiently. So now what if we decide that Bob should, should really not be at those team meetings? Anybody have any ideas well, about how to handle that? Well, I had a question initially, which is, is Bob a member of the team? That's a that's a good point that I hadn't that I hadn't picked up on. Because, um, it it because sounds like you might not be. Team, if he's a member of the team, um, and suddenly he's not invited to team meetings, this is a problem. Mm -hmm. I agree. Uh, and also, what members of the team need to be at the meetings? It could be team leadership is at the meetings, and maybe Bob doesn't fit into that group. Um, this could be a subcommittee of the team, um, and Bob is not on that subcommittee. Um, certainly, if it is really determined that Bob should not be at that team meeting, um, then that needs to be communicated to Bob um, in, a, in a very clear way, and it needs to be made clear that this is not related to um, his, his complaint. Um, but... That can be a business decision. Certainly, we there's no harm in allowing Bob to continue at these meetings, but if if he really doesn't need to be there and there's things for him to be doing other with his time, otherwise, um, you can make that business decision not to have him at those meetings anymore. Those were those were great um, observations. So Sally has complained over the years. Uh, about coworkers' use of sex-based slang. Um, her coworkers regularly get together outside of work to hang out and no longer invite Sally because of her complaints. The comment was, if, if it's not work-related, then I don't think it's an issue. Are you referring to the fact that they're, they're hanging out on their own time? Please use the microphone, please. If, if they're hanging out on their own time and it's not a work-related matter, I, I think you're free to invite or disinvite anybody you want. And so that, I don't think there's a problem. Anybody else have any thoughts on this? I think it depends on where they're having those conversations. Like if they're using that at work and then she complains about it at work and they then they decide not to invite her, that's a problem. But if they're using it when they're hanging out outside of the office, I don't, it's a personal problem, but not an, not an office problem. Certainly, I was, one of my hopes in writing this example was that sex-based slang would be somehow less than um, sexually explicit names from an earlier example. Um, so, so this is meant to communicate some kind of lower level um, harassing conduct that would violate policy, but is not um, quite as egregious. We know that, that this is somewhat work-related because Sally has lodged complaints over the years. And we know that it hasn't been fixed because she's done it over the years and not one time. Um, so there, there are several issues that could be happening here, which is that whatever coaching and, and corrective action that's taken place so far with respect to the use of this language, um, hasn't been enough. And so there needs to be some kind of um, escalation of that to, to drive that point home further. Um, now they used to invite her and now they, they no longer do because of these complaints. Um, I would say that just like, like you mentioned, that is fine. Um, the, the law is not gonna require anybody to socialize with anybody else outside of work. Um, However, uh, if you as a manager got wind of this, it would be, it would be really smart to, to really keep an eye on this situation at work and make sure that any exclusion um, is really uh, limited to non-work time. Um, because hearing this, it sounds like there could be a, that seeping in or there's a risk that, that would seep into the workplace as well. Um, and that, that, for example, not inviting her to meetings or um, you're all at the water cooler chatting and now Sally walks up and everybody, you know, pointedly walks away. 
that type of behavior um, that might not rise to the level of unlawful retaliation, um, but I think would warrant some type of intervention from management. Yeah. So I wanna bring this into a reality of what was acceptable and what's not. Anyone over the age of 40 is likely remember the Jane Curtin and Dan Aykroyd skits from Saturday Night Live. And I won't say them in case it's offensive to anyone, but Dan Aykroyd would call Jane an ignorant something or other. If someone's just watching TV channel or whatever the channel is that runs the old shows and they're talking about it, that was completely acceptable. The comedy of Saturday Night Live for 1975 to 1980 is not necessarily what would be considered funny today. So again, I'm, I'm, I'm really taking issue with the questions of, again, personal time, people, Sally, who, who's no longer, I mean, it's like, if we're not friends and you don't like watching old, I mean, I'm, right now I'm re-watching uh, Star Trek, The Next Generation with my husband. And if there's things from there that people don't like because that was 1988, I don't need to hang out with you. And so I, I guess I really am curious as to where, you know, having conversation of things that are broadcast over TV are going to run afoul of people's feelings when it has absolutely nothing to do with their work or, you know, the fact that you, there are people who literally have never missed an episode of Saturday Night Live. And if they're talking about it and having a good time and somebody takes offense to the comedy of Eddie Murphy, where, where is the real line here? Because I'm watching this presentation and it's basically like feeling that we're painting a beige world, that anything that someone's gonna be offended over is going to be, you know, at what point do you say, this isn't directed at you, it's not impacting work, this is something that's broadcast that the FCC still broadcasts over television and, you know, get a thicker skin. And I say this as in, in a devil's advocate sort of way, because I have fought for people who have been harassed, but it, it never, ever goes anywhere. And so I'm, I'm really just curious what the reality is of what we're talking about. Yeah, I think those are good points. Uh, first of all, we could be friends because I love the next generation. Um, so that would be fine. I, I think you're right. Um, and one of the, one of the things you're getting at is the difference between what is unlawful and what is just against policy and policy is a decision that the organization makes, um, it, within itself. And so organizations are free to draw that line really all the way up to the unlawfulness. Um, you could say we're fine with anything as long as it's not unlawful. Or you could say, you know what, we want more of a beige world. Um, and so it really just depends on what your organization's policy is. Now, as I read the WSBA BOG policy, um, use of any sort of um, derogatory comments related to any kind of protected characteristic would be violating that policy. Um, and it's certainly violating in spirit, I think. Um, but, you know, maybe I'm wrong about that. And part of the way that we would know is how that policy is enforced. If, um, if the WSBA, for example, decided, you know what, this one's fine, then that's the answer. That's not a, a violation of policy. Um, so, so those are decisions that need to be made within the organization on policy. Um, but like we've discussed, this one, I think, does not violate the law. So I don't know how to answer the question more than that. Um, and certainly, you know, all of us have, you know, our own firms or our, our own workplaces um, outside of the WSBA, except for, except for the actual WSBA employees. But, um, and so those policies are likely to be a little different than the WSBA policy. But the WSBA is in a little bit of a, a unique situation of, of really championing justice for all. Um, I, was listen, I was listening to a, a great podcast with Chris Hayes, um, my favorite podcast right now, talking about sex harassment and uh, Title IX. And there's just a lot of research showing that when people don't feel safe in the workplace 
or when they don't feel safe at their university because of harassment, they don't perform as well. Um, and so if, if people aren't performing as well at work because they're worried about um, offensive behavior, um, you know, just my own opinion, one guy's opinion is that, that save the, the talk about um, Dan Aykroyd for after work then. But um, again, that's a organizational decision. Uh, any other questions hey, about, uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, this is Alec, Alec Stevens. Um, so as I was listening to this and looking at the fact pattern, because not everything is, I mean, you, you know, you set this up, but it's, you know, there's, there, there are ways in which this does become a little bit more complex. So for example, um, because the, the, this was under the topic of retaliation as I remember. So um, this is generally, I think, you know, not problematic unless the group becomes a clique that while, while they are off from work, they are also weaving the fun and planning how they're going to attack, how, how they're going to do the work. And Sally's out of the out of the mix. And so Sally is always in a um, disadvantage because socially, because she has complained, she is no longer a part of the group, the off work group, but the off work group is not just off work, only socializing. They're also talking about work. They're also planning how they're gonna do their work. And when they come back, if they keep Sally out of the loop, I do believe Sally may actually find that she has been retaliated against because she has made those complaints. Everything is not as, everything, when we talk about beige, well, a lot of this is not beige. There are different levels of how this becomes complicated. And I would at least hope the managers are making sure that Sally at work is not being frozen out because Sally has in the past complained about the off work, um, the off work behavior that, that she finds offensive. That's a great point. That's kind of the classic example of that is, um, you know, the the male executives making decisions in the in the washroom or out on the golf course, uh, excluding women, um, and so that can be kind of happening here in a way where where all of these coworkers are making business decisions uh, while they're socializing, and Sally is excluded from it. And that's a way. Um, that, that's one of the reasons. Um, although I didn't think of it exactly like that, that's really great. That managers if they know about this should just kind of be watching out for hey is this is this bleeding back into the workplace somehow and that's one example of how it can so um i know we're pretty much out of time i didn't do a great job of pacing myself i apologize um just wanted to talk real quickly about um and i'll try to burn through these if that's okay with you guys uh your guys's job as as the governors um in protecting employees and volunteers, because again, as I say, that's the number one. Um, but then also protecting, you know, the board as a whole, yourselves and the WSBA. So um, one, know the policy, and I think this gets to a little bit of your your um, questions. Um, sorry, I didn't remember your name with Williams. Williamsburg. Williamsworth. Williamsburg. Oh, got it. Um, you know knowing what the policy is and what the limits of that policy are is really the first step. Um, looking for warning signs, just even from the last example, like uh, Governor Stevens mentioned, um, watching out for ways that things that wouldn't be violations of policy might come back into, or things that are happening outside of the workplace might come back into the workplace. Um, recognizing that, that you're a, obviously a leader as a, as a member of the Board of Governors. Um, certainly anyone elected is a, is a, a leader, 
but also, you know, in our own organizations, lawyers are often thought of as leaders as well. So even if you're not in a management or supervisory role, um, we're all, we all are leaders in that sense. Um, handling complaints, I like to tell people just pass it off to HR. Um, um, and then um, that's how you handle complaints really is, is passing off to HR. So step one, knowing the policy. Um, I won't go through all of these, but I think if, if the governors don't know certain policies and, and that is learned by employees, it can kind of cheapen the policy a little bit. So um, making the commitment to just knowing the policies that, that protect your volunteers and employees um, can really just go a long way to showing the, the organization's commitment. Um, the policy also includes examples of harassing conduct. Um, so that can be a, a good way to figure out where that line um, is drawn. Uh, looking for warning signs. Um, if any time you see someone um, not participating to the same extent they used to, uh, you can touch base with them and just find out, you know, how are things going for them and give them an, an opportunity to talk about that. Um, attendance problems, decreases in work performance, um, stress related, you know, headaches or sort of things that might go along with extra stress. Those can all be warning signs that, that someone is experiencing harassment in the workplace. Um, I won't belabor this since I know this was not the most popular part of the topic, but you know, um, <laughs> having modeling good behavior, even when you're off duty is, is still great. And I think that can include some, uh, some banter with friends off duty, certainly. And in complaints. Just know that as a, as a governor, especially employees and volunteers may be coming to you. Um, and so the, the most important thing you can do is take action very quickly. Um, delays can send the message that the, the WSBA doesn't care and that's just not the case. So reporting something to the HR director right away is um, uh, one of the most important things you can do to, to enforce the policy. And then a note about um, confidentiality. We can never uh, ensure complete confidentiality when complaints are made because there's a duty to investigate. Um, and in, in investigating a complaint, you often have to let someone know, hey, this was said about you. How do you respond? That's part of the investigation. So uh, if someone does come to you with a complaint, be very clear with them that this can't be off the record. It can't be between the two of us. I have to um, elevate this complaint to HR, and then we are gonna have to take some kind of um, uh, investigatory steps. Uh, and certainly remind people, I think it's worth reminding people explicitly that there will not be any retaliation um, permitted. Can I ask a question about that quickly? Sure. What if somebody comes to you and says they wanna report something and you say, okay, this is, can't be off the record. I have to report it once you've told me. And they say, "Oh, oh, never mind." Do we just drop it? Uh, I would not just drop it, but um, if they decide they don't want to report, then I don't know that you can force them to do it. Uh, I would strongly encourage them to do it. Um, it's not been my experience that that this really discourages people from reporting, and even if they are initially discouraged. Um, the fact that they were um, concerned enough to come forward in the first place usually means that, that they'll overcome that. Um, so I think it might be worth in that situation talking about why you have this, this uh, need to, to tell HR or what the investigation might look like that, hey, we're gonna keep this as confidential as we can but we also are gonna to need, to, need to investigate so that we can do right by you and other employees who might be experiencing similar um, concerns. But yeah, I, I agree. If, if they really say no, um, then there's probably not a lot you can do. Um, and I, one of the assumptions I'm making there is that you don't know what the uh, subject matter of that complaint is going to be. 
Um, if you know that the complaint is going to be harassment related or about discrimination, um, then I might, uh, then I might push a little harder. Um, but it could be, you know, if somebody wants to make a complaint and it, it might not be something huge. So, um, if they decide they don't want to, I, I, there's not a lot you can do. Yeah. Just a question is, um, if you have, what, what is your thoughts about if you have a situation where a, an employee makes a complaint of a, of another employee, uh, and you think, gosh, you know, certainly could report this to HR, but that in and of itself has issues that potentially might magnify a problem that you think that you might be able to correct between the individuals and bring both people in together and say, look, here's what I'm hearing. Explain to me what's going on here. Is that in your mind appropriate or not appropriate and reasons why uh, either side? Uh, there are, as, as we're even hinting at with this next slide, there are some reasons why that might be appropriate, but those reasons I think are very limited. Um, for example, if the complaint is about the HR director, then even though policy requires reporting to the HR director, then I wouldn't do that. Um, but the answer to your question in the WSBA's case, and um, as I read the policy, there's a requirement that as soon as you learn of any kind of harassing conduct, that that gets immediately reported to the HR director. So in that case, there's no option of handling it on your own outside. Um, one of the things that sounded like um, your question was getting at is this idea that maybe that the mere allegation of harassment or something like that would be such a stain on maybe the um, on somebody's character that that hey if we can handle this in a way that's maybe more sensitive we can take care of it but they won't have to be branded as a harasser forever after. Um, if that's part of the concern, I would just say, trust the HR to handle that and to take that concern seriously as well. Um, complaints should be investigated, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that after the investigation, we're gonna conclude exactly everything happened as alleged in the complaint. Um, so HR is, is good at making those distinctions. To answer your question, yeah, I think I think this question is a little bit similar to what um, Governor Pertzer was saying. But you know, say you have a dis and this is a little bit different. Say you have a dispute with your neighbor over you know who knows what. You know, I think it's always just kind of good to go see if you can't talk to your neighbor and you know, get it worked out because we all know once you call the police on them, <laughs> your relationship with your neighbor is going to be um, at a minimum very strained. So, so, I mean, I think there's a concern, you know, a little common sense might go a long ways. Uh, so, one, I, I would want to push back a little bit as with the comparison of the HR director to the police. Um, I, I think that's a, probably a, an inaccurate comparison, and I don't mean that to be critical, but just just HR's job is not to be policing. Um, HR's job is to be protecting all of the employees. And, um, and that includes employees who are accused of harassment or discrimination or any other kind of policy violations. Um, I also, uh, maybe I'm a little Pollyannish about this, but um, I would hope that, you know, if somebody makes a complaint about me, I would not have a strained relationship with that person that I would understand, okay, that was an opportunity for me um, to be more sensitive or whatever. And so I, I don't think that's a foregone conclusion that, um, that relationships have to be strained just because someone availed themselves of, of a, you know, the anti-harassment policy. Um, but certainly that is a, a potential outcome. So what if the complaint is about you? Um, first of all, kudos to someone for feeling comfortable bringing their complaint directly to you, um, if that's what happened. Um, but if, if you learn from HR that, that there's been a complaint made about you, I, I would say that is really, um, 
the danger zone for potential retaliation because it's such human nature to be a little upset about that. Um, as Mr. Peterson pointed out, it would be natural to have a strained relationship after that. And it can be really difficult not to let that strain manifest itself in a way that, that could be retaliation. So um, if a complaint is made about you, one, cooperate with HR. And I would, if it were me, I would lean on HR and help have them help me kind of work through that process and, and how to interact with any of the complaining employees, assuming you know who they are um, going forward. So I would just use HR as a resource to help, help you react to any complaints made about you. All right, so these are our last um, hypotheticals. You hear Felicia say she really needs a neck rub. John, one of her supervisors, starts to give her a massage at her desk. Um, is this harassment and should you be concerned? Any, uh, anybody wanna tackle this one? So this is um, maybe the one of the aspects of quid pro quo harassment that we didn't talk about before, which is uh, if someone is getting a benefit because of a, a relationship they have, an inappropriate maybe relationship or a sexual relationship they have with their boss and other employees are not getting that benefit as well, um, then that can be harassment. So um, here, probably John should not be massaging Felicia, but at the, the other aspect of this is that some employees could reasonably look at this and say, hey, wait a second, um, what's going on here? And it seems like maybe Felicia is getting, you know, the, the prime projects or is getting more time with the CEO or something. Um, and, and they might start wondering if they're victims of, of harassment in that quid pro quo sense. Um, hopefully this one never happens, but Doug um, browses inappropriate sites on his personal phone while on a break. He keeps it to himself, he's not out there with it, but somebody just happens to glance an image uh, in the break room and complains. Is this harassment? Yeah, I'm gonna say if he's in the break room, he's on company property, and I'm, I'm assuming that's not something that's you know, supported on company property, so yes. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. This is not the most uh, subtle um, example here. Um, but even the fact that he was not sharing it, even the fact that he thought he was doing this in a way that would not be visible to others, um, really just emphasizes that anything we do at work can be visible or overheard by others. And um, so engaging in any kind of behavior like that can be harassment to, um, in this case, Janelle. Um, and the fact that it was on his personal phone, like uh, you raised, he was still in the break room and it was still on company property. In fact, it's probably on company Wi-Fi as well. So um, this one's a, a pretty easy one. Uh, actually, this is our last one. So <laughs> Pamela, a manager, loudly calls one of her subordinates a dumbass when she is angry. The employee files a harassment complaint against Pamela. Is this harassment and what would you do? I apologize if we have any Pamela's here. What's that? I said truth could be a defense. <laughs> if this was a defamation claim, maybe maybe that would be a, a defense for sure. Anybody have any thoughts about this one? Yeah, the so um, calling someone a dumbass is, is, it's not obvious that that's related to any kind of protected characteristic. Um, it's more a bullying behavior, it strikes me, than, than harassing behavior, which would certainly be against company policy, um, but unless it's tied to a protected characteristic would not rise to the level of harassment. Um, and this would be a great opportunity for coaching for um, Pamela on how to maybe better manage her employees and, and provide more effective performance feedback. 
All right, anybody have any questions about any of the slides or any of the topics? All right, well, thank you very much for having me. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to email me. Uh, I think my, my email address is here on the, uh, on the slide. So feel free to email about any questions about this or anything else. Um, happy to talk with you afterward. Don't fall. I wish it would automatically turn on and I wouldn't have to worry about it. But, um, okay. Nancy Hawkins has a question. That's kind of a comment and a question. Um, this is an organization that has faced a sexual harassment claim that costs the organization money. As a result, we're taking some good steps to have what I would hope would be a strong and well-supported sexual harassment or harassment in general um, position. And I was concerned by some of the comments or questions that seemed to draw a line between being at the office and out of the office. And to me, there's not much difference out of the office if the person making the offensive comment or offensive behavior is the you know 40 year old supervisor and the employee that they're you know socializing with outside is the 20 year old new employee or some, you know a fact pattern like that because the power imbalance is still there in my mind and the employees still feel vulnerable the employees still feel that that's someone they have to please However uncomfortable they are, they don't show it because that too, I think somebody said, uh, I think Alex said that it disrupts the team at, in the workplace. And so what happens out of the office to me is very important. Um, I was concerned about the idea that one way around this is for people to have a thicker skin because to me, the answer, if someone says, you know, what you've said or done is offensive, is not, you know, shouldn't be, well, I didn't mean it, you should get over it. The answer should be, I'm sorry, thank you for telling me, I didn't realize that phrase was insulting. And I think all of us, you know, I'm old, uh, the kinds of phrases or words I used when I was 20 or 30 aren't the ones, hopefully, that I would use now at, God forbid, 65. Um, so all of these instances can be opportunities to learn. But a training shouldn't be, in my mind, a way to find ways you know, workarounds or ways out of this. It's how we, how we can have a more safe, more welcoming work for, workplace. And personally, I don't think there can be acceptable jokes about, I mean, everyone, frankly, it's easy in these trainings or whatever to make jokes about sexual behavior sexual jokes, those are kind of easy. Uh, everybody thinks, well, you know, it's no big deal. We all make those jokes. I've made those jokes. But as a um, Jewish lesbian, I feel very differently when I've been in the experience of people making jokes, you know, D jokes to me or F jokes to gay men or N jokes to African-Americans and all the other words for that, they cover every other group. And generally we are expected to just take it as a joke and have a thicker skin. And I don't think we should. And thank God in, in 2021, we're not supposed to anymore have to have a thicker skin. 
we're supposed to expect that our bosses and our coworkers will protect us and speak up for us. It's not just up to the lesbian to speak up. You know, if somebody makes a, you know, lesbian joke, I would expect you to speak up too if I'm too scared to do that or if I'm feeling too uncomfortable. So I really hope this organization takes this seriously um, because it's needed. We know it's needed. We learned that it was needed. Um, but the people we need to be protecting are the, are the victims, not the perpetrators. And I guess um, I, my question to you after that comment, <laughs> I always have to have a question. Would you agree that, um, is there anything I said you disagree with about that? No, for, thank you for saying that. Um, I agree with all of it. And um, I apologize if, if anything I said was to the effect that people should have a thicker skin. I, I do not, uh, that was not the point of this um, presentation. I, and in fact, I think that's really the, the point is that as, as the person who is the subject of a complaint, um, that's who I hope has maybe a thicker skin and can, um, and can take that complaint with some humility and um, as an opportunity. So, so I do not think any, anybody who is offended by inappropriate language at work or inappropriate behavior needs to get a thicker skin. I, and that was very well said. it again um we have a question from uh, i think um uh governor bell right and then followed by uh mr mcpherson online thank you mr president i did not have a question i just wanted to thank the presenter i thought this was a great presentation thank you oh, oh thank you brent you have a question okay and governor williams ruth you have a question it's not a question but this is the second time in this meeting that people have attacked me for the comments that I've made. Mr. Bailey, they're not talking about you saying thicker skin, they're coming at me. And I just wanna make it really clear that I ask these questions because other people don't. I wanna make it explicitly clear that I fully understand the anti-harassment to the point when I witnessed a staff member go through a really horrible situation. I made sure to ask, is it okay if I give you a hug to comfort you? because of the fear of, you know what, I don't want to just assume that they would want to be comforted by me hugging them. So yesterday I was talked about how my comments were ageist. Now I'm being told that I don't fully understand anti-harassment. So I just want to make it really clear. And in fact, I'm actually wearing an undershirt that says, I'm not for everyone. But what I do on this board is to draw a line because other people and the conduct that has been the past of this organization has allowed things to perpetuate. And yeah, I'm going to play the devil's advocate and I'm gonna raise the things that I know people talk about when they leave outside this room. And so if anyone has a question about who I am and what I actually believe, feel free to call me up. Let's have a question. Don't come into the meetings and not look at me and not say my name, go ahead, say it. You wanna call me out for something, feel free. I got the thick skin, I can take it but I'm standing up for the people who don't. This is what I've been since I've been on this board from day one. I've advocated for the people who don't wanna be the ones who have to advocate for themselves. Former Governor Jean Kang had a promise from me that she would never be the one that had to speak up about racist comments. That if I heard it and I witnessed it, I would speak up. And I will do that for sexist comments, sexist behavior, misogynistic behavior, we don't even wanna go into the misogynistic behavior that happened at the September meeting. We can go to the tape and show the governors that made comments that were extremely offensive. So you wanna come for me, go ahead, because I got it. Okay, uh, Mr. McPherson, you had a comment? I do, uh, let me put my hand down. I, I was, <laughs> I was kind of going to stand up for Brent, but I should realize I, nobody needs to do that. I apologize, Brent, if that was my original intent. 
uh, you said most of the things. I, I did not uh, feel that your comments had to do with creating loopholes or finding justifications for behavior. I thought of it as exactly as you referenced it was. But I do actually have a specific comment, but thank you for your long uh, explanation, Brent. I think it was well needed. And, and I've been attending these meetings for 20 years, as you guys know, and I, and I appreciate your candor, and I think it's well uh, needed. My question is, isn't it possible for a subordinate to actually harass a superior? And I'm feeling that, in fact, that there could be situations, and of course, I'm not in an organization that's big, in which a, a, a subordinate who feels comfortable in its power of alleging harassment the other direction uh, could use that, uh, and whether you've experienced that yourself uh, in cases that you may have seen or your colleagues have seen, uh, Nate, uh, that in fact harassment can go both ways. Is that true? It's absolutely true that um, that anyone at at work can harass anyone else. Um, so a subordinate could could engage in harassing conduct toward a superior, and it could rise to the level of, un of unlawful harassment. Um, and I think it's important to note that that we often think of the power structure between a superior and a subordinate employee as being the one that kind of creates the, the opportunity for, for certain types of harassment or discrimination. But there are other um, structures at play that, that can create power dynamics. And, and so a subordinate employee might actually have, uh, I don't know the right way to say this, but maybe the upper hand in that power relationship for various reasons over the manager. Um, and even without that, they can engage in harassing conduct. Um, but, but it's also important to recognize that, that manager uh, subordinate is not the only power dynamic uh, in play at the workplace. Oh, thank you. Uh, Governor Stevens. Uh, thank you. And um, Mr. Bailey, thank you for your presentation. Uh, a couple of things that I think, um, you know, when we're talking about harassment, um, <clears throat> at least some of these facts, there needs to be someone who steps forward and says, I find this offensive. And to me, anyway, harassment really begins to happen when the initial the initial effort either by the person to the um, to the offender um, goes unaddressed or they go to HR and it goes on and the and the behavior continues to me that's when really we start talking about harassment because it's being either unaddressed or the person is feeling victimized. Now, that being said, um, Governor Williams Ruth, I often listen to you very, very clearly. But when I disagree with you, I am not coming for you. Um, when I make statements like ageism, that was not personal to you. There were a number of your colleagues who from my, from my posture were really getting into that area. I would hope that as governors, we can disagree and disagree strongly, but simply because we disagree strongly doesn't mean that we are coming for anyone. Um, and I, I just want to make sure, and Mr. Mr. President, you had a great training that perhaps we need to have another round, which is how we actually engage with one another. But everything is not all one way or the other, and we raise issues and we raise concerns. And we do it, I hope, and I hope I do it, with a great deal of respect. And certainly if I am not being respectful, I want folks to let me know. But it would never be my intent to come for anyone. And just as a, I guess, a way of my wicked sense of humor, 
Um, well, no, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna go. Mm. I just. <laughs> Although it has to, it has to do with the idea of us all having a thicker skin when we are called to account for the things we say, and understand we're saying that in this forum, but it is usually not personal. It really is about the thing that's happening. So I just want to leave that there. It's not about coming for anybody. Do we have any more questions or comments uh, for our presenter? I don't should look around the room here. Doesn't look like it. Thank you very, very much, Mr. Baylor. Really appreciate it. And um, I'm hoping that we can get a copy of your PowerPoint slides because uh, I think the, the, um, the members would really appreciate having the opportunity to review them again and, may, and maybe again and again. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so we've been going for about an hour and a half and I know we have uh, Mr. Dawson who's gonna talk about email uh, security and maybe some more internet security in a very important presentation. But I thought maybe we should take about a five minute break, break and, uh, and uh, get him on the line and come back in about five minutes. Thanks so much. <laughs>